Thank you for the kind introduction. I'd like to thank you for your time this evening. Um, this um, project really is, is, is Gabriella's project. I'm, I'm not a computational scientist, so what I'd like to do is just give you a sort of a, an overview of the field, and then Gabriella will take you through some more of the detail of, of the project that we're interested in. It's my first visit to Pondicherry. I've been to Madurai a few times, um, so it's very nice to come here uh, and to meet everybody. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a sort of 10 to 15 minute talk on artificial intelligence and glaucoma and, and just introduce just some of the terms that people use. So this is the ophthalmoscope. This was invented in the 1800s by Helmholtz, a German uh, ophthalmologist. And you can see even in the early days the ability to visualize the retina, visualize the optic disc, led to people making drawings. Now we can take photographs and now we can actually analyze those photographs. So this, this sort of approach has been in ophthalmology for, for many, many years. So if we look at, at glaucoma or the assessment of a glaucoma patient, it is actually quite a data-rich space. So we, have, we make a number of objective measurements of the patient. So we have intraocular pressure, ophthalmoscopy, gonioscopy, visual fields, pachymetry, OCT, and different imaging technologies. So we actually have got a very data-rich environment. And, and the idea behind computational approaches to, to diagnosis is to sort of utilize that data maybe in a more efficient way or more accurate way than we do clinically just in our normal uh, clinical practice. So th this has been done before. So radiology uh, uses these types of models, artificial intelligence, mach machine learning or deep learning, so that they can take a CT scan, they have the image, they look at the image and they make a diagnosis. Uh, and really what they, they, they've done is to try and add in some computational assessment of the image to help the clinician make the diagnosis, to add some more detail and more information um, to, the, to the assessment. And so these terms, artificial intelligence, these go back to sort of really the early days of computers or computational techniques. Then we have machine learning, and now we really talk about deep learning, which is a sort of data mining of, of, of large data sets with these deep learning technologies. And so really to define those, so artificial intelligence is the quest to build software that, that runs on a machine that can think and act like humans, basically. So that's like quite a broad definition. Machine learning is a subset of that in which you use algorithms that learn and improve uh, without being specifically programmed by a human to, to sort of improve. And then deep learning is, is an attempt to mimic the human brain, to take in all of the sort of um, detail of the data using neural networks and to, to come up with some sort of assessment so the sort of layers of approaches. So really in, in any type of learning, you can have supervised learning. So, so here really you have a training set. So a clinician decides here are a set of images that are glaucoma. They, they design an algorithm which learns that these are the images that cause glaucoma, that, that, that were diagnosed glaucoma. And then you, you, you run your raw data through that here and you hopefully have some sort of algorithm and then some processing and then some output so definitely glaucoma, probably glaucoma or normal. So that's supervised where you have a training set to do it. Unsupervised is where you don't have a training set. So you basically throw the data at the algorithm or the computer without telling it anything uh, to, in, in order to interpret that data set. And then it works out the algorithm that best describes the data, uh, which is a little bit more like what Google does so that it takes this data and then it, it works out how it's going to look at it and comes up with an answer but it's a bit harder to deconstruct that answer so how did it get to that answer because you, you don't know the algorithm really and so deep learning so if you take the optic disc it, it, it takes different features of the optic disc and then feeds it into a neural network which Gabriella will talk about and then we look at this um, area under the curve to look at sensitivity and specificity so really, if you've got a line that runs like this, it's like tossing a coin effectively. So it's heads or tails, so it's not a very good predictive value. So the closer the line looks like the yellow line, the closer it, it is to sort of predicting the true event. And so that's what people look at the area under the curve or the receiver uh, operating curves. So that's, these are very important statistics or measures that people will present to show how well their algorithm works. So really, everyone wants an algorithm that's sort of in the yellow area. And so if you look at AI and ophthalmology, 
These are the sort of publications that, that are coming out. So you can see diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, AMD, really represented highly with a number of papers um, in, in that area. And you can see as time goes by that the number of publications, so diabetic retinopathy in blue, glaucoma in orange, is, is increasing. Um, so these uh, technologies or techniques are, are encroaching into routine or, uh, or clinical practice. So just glad Gabriel will go through some of the, the, the studies, but, but basically a lot of the uh, deep learning and glaucoma use these neural networks where they look at a number of, they take the disk images, they look at a number of features, they build a neural network, and, and they come up with a, with a, with a, um, a detection um, score or, or strategy. Um, what Gabriel has designed, which he'll talk about, is, is, is att attaching some certainty to that, 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 that diagnosis. And so you can do that for OCT images, you could do it for disk images, you could do it for visual fields, or you could integrate them all into some type of neural network or some algorithm which would uh, 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 increase your ability to diagnose glaucoma or increase your ability to detect progression. So there are some uh, papers in the literature. So this is one looking um, with a neural network type approach, and you, and you can see some relatively good um, areas under the curve, so approaching uh, one, uh, so any level of glaucoma, not so good for mild glaucoma, but much better for moderate to severe glaucoma. And here's a number of papers where they've looked at different parameters of glaucoma assessment, uh, various studies with different levels of area under the curve. So obviously, approaching one is, is the best way um, or the most accurate way to, to describe the data so that there are more and more papers in this field. So wh why is it important in glaucoma? Well, if we start with the issues, which we're, we're all aware of, we have a lot of patients to see. We've got doctors of different skills or technicians of different skills. Um, we've got areas that might not be served well with medical specialities, so isolated populations. And we get delays uh, can lead to, uh, delays in disease treatments can lead to bad out uh, poorer outcomes. So if you look at where uh, image analysis and AI sits in this, uh, for the heavy workloads, we could reduce mistakes with repetitive work, so we have a more objective measure of the optic disc. Varying levels of skill, you could have a, a more accurate or, or higher quality diagnosis. Um, no specialities, you might be able to do this remotely and detect people without them needing to see a clinician. Um, and if you can get an early diagnosis, we all know that patients who present with advanced disease and glaucoma are more likely to go blind. So earlier diagnosis means more prompt treatment, means more le less visual loss. And if you look at this globally, I mean, you, you know these figures uh, working in, in, in India, you know, the, the population with, with glaucoma worldwide is very large, it's increasing, uh, and it's the second most common cause of uh, blindness in the world. So if you look at in, in the UK and the USA, Europe, so 50% of patients are still undetected in the community, which increases significantly in, in underdeveloped parts of the world. So there is a real issue about case definition, uh, even in, in, in countries with advanced healthcare systems. So we need to address why that is and, and, and address if we could do things better. Um, here are some of the prevalence figures. So, so India, um, prevalence 1.5 to 1.9. You can see Africa has it's got a huge uh, population with, with glaucoma that, that, that's increasing. Um, so artificial intelligence has a place to play, I think, in probably all of these uh, geographical areas, but particularly in, in Africa and probably Southeast Asia. And really what we're attempting to do is to differentiate a normal optic disc from a glaucomatous optic disc, but to do it in a very objective way using a disc image. So ideally a disc image taken on, on a quite relatively high quality camera. So this is, Gabriel will talk more about this, but Gabriel has designed um, a statistical model to evaluate this, the shape of the optic disc, um, which I was lucky to be involved with. Um, and. That, that has yielded some good results in, in some data sets that we've looked at, and we'd like to develop this into some real world um, situations in, in diagnosing glaucoma in the community and diagnosing progression in hospital based patients. So, the, the panacea for us is if we could have a mobile device that could screen the optic disc and could apply some statistical or computational algorithm to detect the likelihood of glaucoma and to give some sort of probability or certainty to that diagnosis, 
then we think that would be a, a, a great advance for um, healthcare and also fits the ethos of the Aravindai Hospital, which is to uh, avoid needless blindness. So I think this would be a good uh, area and, and a very uh, important thing uh, in terms of public health. So I think Gabriella will show you some of this. So the artificial intelligence is with us in the clinic and it's getting better, but it probably can't replace doctors just yet. So what we would hope to do is integrate some sort of clinical data or clinical um, reasoning with an, a, a machine learning or a statistical algorithm to, to come up with a sort of a hybrid model that may improve diagnosis. So um, I'm just going to finish there. This is the north coast of Ireland. This is probably the sunniest day. The, the maximum temperature is usually 22 degrees centigrade in the summer. Usually it's between 14 and 15 degrees centigrade. And it's very wet and very green. Um, so we're feeling the, the temperature a little bit here. Um, so I, I'm going to pass over to Gabriella. And um, um, yeah, no, it's not too bad. It's a bright summer's day. Uh, so Gabriella is going to talk a little bit more detail about the sort of the, the nuances of uh, artificial intelligence um, and glaucoma and in medicine. And then we'll stop the presentations and then we'll take questions at the end. So if you want to ask some questions, then we'll do it then. So I'll pass over to Gabriella. And uh, I'll let. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for having me here and thank you very much for all hospitality. Um, so I am a statistician uh, by training and in fact I'm a mathematical statistician but I have been working with neuroscientists, epidemiologists and over the last uh, seven years with ophthalmologists at least 80% of my profile and my research projects are in ophthalmology. Um, so what I will be talking about is the automated methods for glaucoma detection. And especially, I will be asking question, should we use machine learning methods to do that, or should we use a simpler statistical modeling methods for that? And I will explain the terms. So just to give a motivation, um, recently we are witnessing unprecedented amount of data collected in ophthalmology. You are witnessing that too. And what I mean by that is you have to do decisions about treatment, diagnosis, screening, monitoring, and those decisions are becoming increasingly large because you have to look in the very large data in terms of images. This is millions of pixels. You need to look into demographics. Um, you look also into outcome variables and clinical variables. And uh, there are four important Vs that are out there in terms of big data, and there is variety. You look into different forms of data um, from a statistical or mathematical point of view. Uh, that can be, for example, uh, blood pressure is a continuous data. Age is continuous because it's measured on continuous scale. Um, gender is categorical because it's female, male. Images uh, are also data because there are millions of pixels and there are millions of values. Okay. And th those are very important principles because if you talk about with a statistician or if you read a paper to review or you write your own paper, you need to understand basic principles like what is, for example, variable. And variable is anything that can vary and it can have different forms like continuous, categorical, etc. The other important V is volume. We have large numbers of variables, large numbers of patients. So it can go either in terms of patients or in terms of variables that we measure. Velocity is the speed by which data are generated, typically longitudinally, meaning we measure data on patients over time. And also veracity is the most important V, although very much neglected in papers, and that's about uncertainty. So images of retina, for example, they may be low quality or high quality. And there is then uncertainty, how do we do diagnosis if the quality of image is low? Or when we, um, patient, we want to see him, for example, every three months, but it doesn't exactly happen every three months. What do we do with that? Okay. And missing data is another big problem. Um, so missing data would mean that patient missed the visit completely, 
or patient arrives to visit, but a patient is not able to sustain every single clinical evaluation for some reason. So how do we then analyze such big data? I decided to bring uh, this, um, I hope, funny example. Um, and that is example saying, okay, which car should I buy? Which one is better? Is it the Škoda 100? That's the one that I draw when I got my license when I was 18. Um, I am from Czechoslovakia, so that's Škoda. Or should I drive Nissan Qashqai is what I have now, and it has lots of cameras. It has, um, it tells me when I'm going backwards. It has very good driving properties. It's very comfortable. Both, they can also drive me to my destination. One is probably more comfortable. Um, so I would compare them, the one on the left, to simpler statistical data analysis methods, which can also get me to my destination to analyze the data. This can be pro probably the machine learning and artificial intelligence and deep learning algorithms, which are extremely big robust algorithms um, where I don't need to very carefully think about how to build a model because I don't build a model at all. I just need to build a artificial neural network, okay? But then I just completely trust the algorithm. So what happened to me, for example, is I trust my car so much that actually in over three years I had three accidents. Uh, one of them was my fault. I just ran into my wall in the, my front yard because I was not so careful. But the Škoda car, in 15 years I had no accident, okay? So what I want to say with this is when we use a, a very simple traditional statistical methods, those are the methods that we should try first always because they should surely show us what truly in data is. When we then understand our data, we should look into more sophisticated methods. Um, and this is how, this is roughly how my car looked like, but I, it's not my car because I was feeling um, not very proud to take picture of my own car. So machine learning, um, machine learning, one possible definition is it is a method of data analysis that automates analytical model building. And it is a branch of artificial intelligence based on the idea that systems can learn from data, identify patterns and make decisions with minimal human intervention. Okay, so that would be the big car. If you go on Google, which I did over the last three years, and I was uh, looking into what is the difference between statistical learning and machine learning. I wanted to really find out because I'm a statistician and I felt like, oh, what's going on? Is somebody going to replace me now? And I actually found out some people say, yes, there is a big difference. Some people say, no, there is not much difference. My answer would be they are built on same statistical and mathematical principles. They are both built for the purpose of creating decision support systems such as diagnosis of the patient, screening, monitoring. However, machine learning is a big fancy car, very fancy methods. Uh, there is minimal human intervention in building this model, okay? And statistical models are simpler and they can only be used for scenarios where you have lower number of variables, lower number of measurements that you do on your patients or for scenarios where you do measure a lot, but you can some intuitive way, you can reduce it into a lower dimension. So that's actually what happened to us later, and I will show you example. Also, when you Google uh, statistical and machine learning, you will find out that there are terms used in statistics that are called differently in machine learning. So for example, what we call variable in statistics in machine learning and deep learning and artificial intelligence uh, community, it is called feature what we call parameter, beta, for example, that's called weight in machine learning. If I'm estimating a statistical model in machine learning, it's called learning process, okay? And there are very famous examples of machine learning, like for voice recognition, like Alexa, self-driving car. My car is not self-driving yet. And um, what I'm showing here on the left is, for example, a support vector machine where you have these empty dots. They may be, for example, patients who are healthy, and you have these full dots. They may be patients who, ha who have disease, and you may want to try to find the boundary here that will separate one group from the other. And this is done by placing 
support vectors all around here. In this case here, this boundary is all linear. Um, what is important to say is that here, you don't actually learn anything about the disease itself. All you learn is where you should place the boundary, and that's how machine learning, deep learning algorithms work. They realize where is the boundary, how the decision should be made, without actually telling us some new knowledge about the disease. Now, statistical modeling, um, some basic. So, for example, in the let's have we have several people, and we know their weight and height, and we plot them here. Okay, so this is a typical scatter plot. Okay. And if you look at it, you immediately see, okay, this is increasing trend, and maybe I can even fit a linear model, okay? And I can find a way uh, how to put it here the best pragmatic way by, for example, minimizing the sum of squares, meaning minimizes the distance of these points from the line. So that's what I did here, okay? And so what I'm doing here is a statistical modeling because I'm saying, I think there is, an there is an increasing relationship. I don't know exactly what this relationship is, it only Mother Nature knows, but I can very well approximate it by a linear line, which would be now my statistical model. And now I actually learn something, because when I fit it, I can now start asking hypothesis questions, such as, um, what is the mean difference in height between two people person who is 68 kilograms, a person who is 70 kilograms. What is their mean difference in height? Okay, and I can even give confidence interval for it. And I can do it all because I did this fit, and I fit its statistical model, and I can ask all sorts of hypothesis questions. Okay, so that means I'm generating knowledge, and that's what happens in statistical modeling. Now, we can actually go further. Not only we can do more, the knowledge creation, meaning um, testing whether this slope is actually significant and testing what are differences between different weight groups, we can now also go further, we can go into predictions. So for example, a new person comes into a room, here it is, and we know his weight. What is his likely height? Well, I can again use this statistical model. So for example, if his weight is 70 kilograms, I can just go all the way here to this yellow line and oops, yeah, and then I go here and I read the number almost 170 centimeters, okay? So I now moved from doing statistical inference and knowledge generation into prediction. And prediction is something similar or analogical to detection of disease, okay? So for example, if somebody has this weight, what is the probability that the person is diabetic, for example, etc. okay? It doesn't need to be about height, but of course we would need to have data for it. So what I want to say is that statistical modeling can be used for hypothesis, testing, and knowledge generation, and understanding our data sets and our patients, but also doing the prediction or detection, in this case, of the height. So this is exactly what we did in glaucoma. So what I will talk about now is a glaucoma detection work that we did, and it's called a tale of two solutions, the statistical and machine learning, okay? So, um, and I will be talking about how do we detect glaucoma from color fundus photographs. Um, and here is one example, and the optic disc has important feature, the optic cup, and also here is the roughly where the boundary of the optic disc is. And here is an example that I took from this reference showing four optic discs and also showing the correspondent vision. So the person here is illustration of the extreme glaucoma where the peripheral vision is lost. And the question is, can we actually use these images to say um, whether they are glaucomic or not? So when we look into literature, there are, in the moment, there is a very big interest into uh, detecting glaucoma, obviously because it is now also second um, most important loss of vision in the worldwide. 
And there are many deep learning algorithm solutions or machine learning solutions. So for example, this one that was brought to our uh, attention is by Lee et al. from American Academy of Ophthalmology, where they used a retrospective study. They had 48,000 fundus photographs. However, out of those, only 39,745 were used because the other 8,000 were not used because of the low quality. And what they did is they used deep learning. They used these 39,000 images and the annotation, glaucomic or not glaucomic, glaucomic, not glaucomic, okay, zero as in once. They let the machine to learn and then um, they see how this machine is good on new images. And in fact, I should say, these 39,000 images were divided into two data sets. One was training data set, which is the data set on which the machine learning algorithm is built, meaning machine learns, and then a separate data set on which the machine is now tested. So the images from the training data set are now put into machine, and we want to see whether the machine says this is glaucomic or not and how often the machine is correct and how, how often it is not correct. And this can now be evaluated by looking at those area under the curves that Colin showed. And what they showed is they had accuracy, area under the curve, 98.6%, which is very high, okay? And this is roughly, this is how they, the, how they had this data, the 48,000, and here is 3,000 images who had poor location and 5,000 poor quality images. Okay. There are more papers out there. For example, this one from, again, deep learning from scientific reports, and they used 14,000 images, and again, they split them into two data sets, one for training of the machine learning algorithm and one for testing. Uh, the algorithm was a little bit different and there are more papers. So what we did was different. We decided to come up with a statistical way. And what we decided was the following. We talked to clinicians, I talked to clinicians, and they told me that very often the best or the simplest thing to do is to calculate vertical cap to disc ratio, okay? So I calculate the cap, I calculate the disc, I do cap to this ratio. If it is over 0.7, then roughly there is an indication that that's glaucoma. That's how I understand it, okay? But clinicians are also aware that this is very crude, but still the best that is, well, still it is done this way. Um, so with computer scientists, we realized, okay, why would we just use this vertical? Well, clinicians said it's because if a deformation happens here, if this rim starts disappearing, it happens vertically. I mean, it starts vertically, so okay. But then we decided why not we just calculate this ratio all the way around rather than just vertically, okay? So we had to find the center of the cup and then we calculate the distance from the center to the, to the edge of the cup and also distance from the center to the edge of the disc and calculate the ratio and then go all the way around and that's how we did it. And um, we decided that we will use this to quantify the whole deformation all around the optic disc. Then we decided that as a second step, we will see whether there is an association between the deformation that we quantify and the actual disease, whether there is glaucoma or not. And then once we confirm the association, we decided we will come up with a discrimination rule. So this is just like when you saw that running ex runner example. We first fitted the linear model, we confirmed there is an association between height and weight, and then we decided to use it also for prediction. So this is the same thing here. So this illustrates how we went all around in 360 degree for each eye in different direction, of course. And also what we decided, uh, we didn't do it every one degree, we only did it every 15 degrees. So we had 24 numbers around here, okay? So here it is. This is one image from um, Origa dataset, which is online available. This is healthy. 
and here it is uh, segmented out. So what you see is the black background is everything but the optic disc. The gray one here is the rim and the white is the optic cup. This segmentation has been done semi-automatically using um, Origa software, and that was actually done by the owners of Origa dataset, so that wasn't done by us. And the way how they actually did it, I'll show you here, is that they had the software, they had clinician to click with mouse on several points around cup, and also on several points around disk, and then click the run button, and the software automatically fitted an ellipse. Okay, and you may argue this is not the best way to do it because uh, if it is glaucomic, it may not be elliptical anymore. There may be some different shapes starting happening, okay? But we started with that. Um, so here, what you see is the healthy retina um, segmented out. What you see here are those 24 cup to disc ratios all around with in the middle is zero, zero, and the distance from zero, zero to the number is basically the ratio, okay? But it's very hard to see from here and to make any uh, conclusion what you look at. It's much better to see when you actually plot it again, but now on a proper Cartesian system where you have numbers from zero to 360 as a degrees, yeah, as you go all around geometrically. And then here the height is actually the ratio that you get. So at zero degree, which was here, okay? At zero degree, the ratio was somewhere between 0.4 and 0.5, okay? And then the ratio started going up and then down and up and then down. And this is not surprising because these are two centered ellipses and if the disk is healthy, they are nicely centered. So mathematically, when we calculate these ratios, we should see two nice humps, okay? Now, if you actually have a disk that is glaucomic, then there is a deformation. Like here, there is a thinning of the rim when you look at this picture, it's hard to see, but when you actually plot it, you see that it only has one hump, okay? So what was happening, again, here at zero degree, which was here vertically, this was the ratio, and as we were going around, it started increasing and then it de decreased down, okay? Um, so now when we plotted it all together, we uh, start started scratching our heads because we saw that there is lots of overlap. So what you see on the left is roughly 500 healthy optic discs, and all these blue lines are so-called what we call spaghetti lines because I simply plot those 24 numbers and I just join them with spaghettis, okay? And I get something what I call a profile. So each eye gives me now a profile, and I want that profile to have nice two humps. But I also see that um, the image from previous slide, the profile is here at the bottom, the black one. The overall average of all the profiles, the very simple average, is this light blue line, is somewhere in the middle. It's far away from the eye that I showed you in previous slide. Why is that? It's because people are born with different size of optic discs. And this is contributing to those who have large optic discs. They have, in, they have naturally larger cup to disc ratios, am I right? And therefore, they are gonna be on top here. They're gonna be here. And those who are born with smaller optic disc, they will be here, okay? So, um, so there's healthy ones. The glaucomic ones, they were slightly, in average, they were slightly higher. So you see this yellow line, the average, is slightly higher. I don't almost see any hump here. This is almost flat. And the glaucomic disc from the previous slide is shown in black, is here, okay? So why we, were, why we were puzzled is because when we saw that there is a very big overlap here, and that's intuitive because you already saw using this rule of 0.7 is not good enough. So what we realized is instead of looking at the actual height of these profiles, we should look at the actual shape of the profile. And in statistics, there is actually a very nice remedy for that. And the remedy is that into linear regression model that you saw, for example, with the runner, 
we just add a random effect. We say, okay, Mother Nature randomly created my octet disk smaller, and therefore all my 24 numbers are smaller. And somebody else, Mother Nature randomly gave him a bigger octet disk, therefore his all 24 numbers are bigger. And I just add this additional element in my model. And that's how we did it. So here is the model. Here is the, this is the number, the random effect, okay? This is just measurement error, some noise, like every statistical model has it. This is a parameter for glaucoma or not, okay? Because those who are glaucomic, th this number, beta, should be positive because they have higher, in average, they have higher numbers, right, of the profile. And these are just sinus cosine functions that will explain me the whole shape, okay? And I use some statistical quantitative measure to figure out how many of these sinus cosine functions I should put in so that I am not putting too many or too little. And it turned out to be all I need is actually four or actually two angles, okay? And so the way how you should look at it is this is just a little bit fancier regression model fancier in terms of that I added sinus cosinus here to model the shape and fancier also because I added this random effect here because some people have smaller optic disks, some bigger. The good thing about this random effect is I don't need to know what Mother Nature did. I just need to assume that Mother Nature did something. This is unmeasurable, okay? And I just need to add it into this model. And in a way it behaves like random error or measurement error. Um, however, what it does, it makes all profile higher for one person or lower for one person. So it does what I actually need, and it w works wonders. So this is what we did. These are the data superimposed. They are overlapping. This is the model that we fit, okay? M what model says, model is telling me what is probability that I see a particular profile given that the disk is glaucomic, and what is probability that I see a particular profile given that disk is healthy. So that's what the linear regression or linear mix effect model, how it's called, this fancy model is telling. But you clinicians, you need to know something different. You want to know the other way around. You want to know what is probability of glaucoma, given that I see a particular profile, okay? So that's what you need. So I actually need to reverse it. So we reversed it by using Bayesian principles, okay? So we said we have some prior knowledge about probability of being glaucomic. That can be, for example, for example, just knowing the prevalence, if you want to be very naive, okay? And then we just update it, okay? And that's what we update using empirical bias rule in statistics. Um, and what this rule is telling me, it's telling me what is the probability that given seeing a particular profile of 24 numbers of a new patient, what is probability that this is glaucomic, or what is, what is probability that this is healthy. And once I know this probability, I can now compare it with some agreed threshold, for example, threshold 0.80%, okay? So whatever you feel is important, or whatever you feel will make your screening the best, okay? Or diagnosis, for which purpose it is used. So since I fit statistical model, I can also actually look into a big table of all these associations, and I can see that yes, um, the model that I found is statistically significant and there is also difference between these two groups. And then I can use it for detection of glaucoma. So what we did was um, we had 650 images from Origa dataset. We split them into, actually Origa owners split them into two halves. They already published paper on vertical cap to disc ratio, which was around 83% accuracy of detecting glaucoma. And we use exactly the same split of the data set into the training data set, the data set on which I fit my model and I calculate my decision rule. And then I have a testing data set, the, the other half, which I now use in order to see how accurate is my algorithm, okay? And this curve is telling me how accurate it is, so here is the specificity and the sensitivity. And this 
45 degree line is the line if I was just flipping a coin for every patient who comes, okay? And I want this curve to go all the way to the corner, then it is the best. So this was very good, this was 99.6% accuracy. But of course, this accuracy depends on how the split into training and testing was done. So what we next did was we ran lots of splits. Um, we did actually 100 random splits. So the whole data set of 650 was divided into 70% of data set just for training and deriving the decision rule, and 30% for, train, for testing to see how accurate it is, the algorithm, and we did it 100 times. Okay. And each time we calculated the accuracy, for example, measured as area under the curve, so it is 98.3%. And we compare it with one of the machine learning algorithms, the support vector machine, which was only 82%. At this point, uh, computer science uh, colleagues couldn't believe it. Why this is such a small number, while actually machine le learning algorithms are being said to be so good. And my explanation is because support vector machine needs much bigger data set to learn. So imagine, for example, a child, two-year-old, and you put lots of food in the room, nothing is poison, okay? And you just let the child to choose. You don't tell him what to eat, what food will make him feel good, okay? And the child will find out, trial error, what makes him tummy ache, what he likes, what he doesn't like, okay? And what goes with what. Or you can do it the other way. You can actually lead the child, you can teach him what he should eat to feel good, what he should eat, before dinner, what he shouldn't eat before going to bed, etc. And that way the child will actually learn faster and faster get some healthy habit, hopefully. Um, the first way, it will take him lots of trial errors because you don't supervise, you don't give any, ex any the knowledge that you let him have, okay? So that's how would I explain it here. Um, in spatial algorithm, in statistical algorithm, we use some knowledge the knowledge that those are nicely, two nice ellipses, one into each other. And we put this knowledge into the model, and that way we could actually train the model and train the decision rule on much smaller data set because we just need less data. But with support vector machine, you don't give any knowledge in, you just want the machine to learn about it by itself, which is good, but in this case it needs more data. Um, and here is one more example where we actually did a so-called external validation. So what you saw in previous example, that was internal, meaning the data set that comes from the same center is just split into two halves, one to derive decision rule, one to test this decision rule. And that's called internal validation. And internal validation is important because we want to be sure that this measure of accuracy, the area under the curve, is not too optimistic, is not too overestimated. So in order to make it more optimistic, we do internal validation. But what is even more important is to do external validation. And that means suddenly you, you take data from completely different part of the world um, or different center. And in this case, this was RIM1 from Canarian Islands. And in this data set, there were 150 images. So it was smaller one. And there were three categories. They were glaucomic, healthy, and also suspected. So when we just did these simple uh, spaghetti plots, you see that the red ones, the glaucoma, is kind of on the top. The green ones are suspected, are somewhere in the middle. And the healthy ones have two nice humps, okay? You also see that some of these blue profiles are not full. There is missing data, and that's because we couldn't calculate those cup to disk ratios on all of the 24 locations. Why? Because in this case, we use a so-called fully automated segmentation, which was done by the computer science people at the University of Liverpool. And they actually use deep learning for that. So deep learning can also be used not only for disease detection, but also for detection of the, of the edges or boundaries, in this case of cup and disk. So when you look at this, um, it is more wiggly, these green lines, and that's because we are not fitting ellipses anymore, 
this is actually a fully automated algorithm to segment the cup and disk. And sometimes the segmentation algorithm just couldn't figure out where the boundaries are, and that's why we have here some missing data. So the good thing about statistical algorithm is that um, in statistics there is a way to either impute missing data, but you can also impute the missing data for machine learning algorithms, meaning if you don't have data here, you somehow impute it, you say, okay, I just join it, but then you are making assumption that if you did measure it, it would be there. So the question is whether you can live with such assumptions when doing imputations. But there is also in statistics, there is a way not to impute in some scenarios. And for example, this linear mix effect model that I showed you is able to use all the data without actually imputing anything. It just uses the data as they are, and that's fine. The, the area under the curve was now smaller. It was around 91%, okay? And here is the probability of glaucoma for each of the 150 and something eyes. So you see these ones were glaucomic. The probability was almost the posterior probability of glaucoma based on those 24 numbers profile. Almost all of them, the probability was almost one, but there were four of them here. Um, these blue ones are healthy. Lots of them were here, uh, estimated as probability zero, but there were also some very high. And these are the intermediate ones, the suspected ones. So how is it possible that a 12 parameter statistical model gives the same accuracy as 100,000 parameters deep learning algorithms, okay? Um, so I showed you, um, there is a paper by Lee who used deep learning and their accuracy was as high as ours, around 99%, okay? First of all, we didn't use the same data sets, so we cannot really fully compare. That would be the best way to do. But second of all, um, what I think my intuition is, is that um, the, this 12 parameter statistical model worked very well because we used this existing, existing knowledge that they should be ellipse if healthy. And therefore, we actually need less of the data. And in fact, we used 50 times less number of patients or eyes. Yeah. Um, and in fact, there is a very large discussion on intersection and communication and how these disciplines should work together. Discipline of statistics, which is my discipline, discipline of data science, and discipline of machine learning. And I would like to say that I found this particular summit very good, and it's, it was live streamed worldwide, and actually it is still available on the web, like six hours of recordings of talks and panels, discussions about machine learning, data science, and statistics. And two main things that I learned from that is we need to be really be aware of quality of data, quality of images, selection bias, for example, because if the quality of data is low, nor statistical, nor machine learning method will help. They will give results that may be also biased. Um, also, what is very important is this symposium said that they see increasing number of machine learning papers using two small data sets. And that also indicates that yes, they need more data than statistical algorithms. Um, what statisticians are saying there were some uh, papers published in Statistics and Probability Letters summarizing that um, there is a problem with machine learning in terms of machine learning doesn't interpret, it doesn't give us knowledge about uh, causal pathways, uh, it doesn't explain what in the algorithm worked, where around the optic disk, what, what area was actually the most informative in terms of detection, but statistical algorithm can do that. Machine learning algorithms, typically they don't provide uncertainty quantification, which is they don't say how certain they are about estimating the probability of glaucoma, for example. So if I have two patients and each of them algorithm says, I'm 85% 80, probability, there is 85% probability that the disc is glaucomic. And in this eye is also 85% probability that this is glaucomic, okay? Now, it may be the case that actually in this patient here on, the, on my left, actually the images were quite low quality, 
but still algorithm worked out number 85. So what it means, I'm actually not very certain here, but I may have very good quality on the patient who is on my right, because I had lots of very good quality images, and I'm very certain. So actually, this number has a different weight now. And one way to express it is by calculating uncertainty or calculating the so-called credible interval, which is the same thing as confidence interval. So if I can actually provide confidence interval saying from 0.2, uh, from 20% to 100%, I will say, oh, this is really wide interval. This doesn't help me at all. If you tell me the probability of glaucoma here is between 20 to 100%, that doesn't help, even though 85 is somewhere there in the middle. Well, not in the middle, but it's somewhere there. But if for the other patient you, says, you say, well, the probability of glaucoma is 85%, but the confidence interval or credible interval is between 80 and 90, then I will go, oh, this is very good precision. Actually, whatever data we have about this patient is so good that we are quite certain here, okay? Um, so those type of uncertainty quantifications are important. Statistics provides it automatically because we do confidence intervals. In machine learning, there is now already work being done by providing these uncertainties, but there is some extra effort to do that. Uh, the application to very limited training data is something that you also need to remember if you see a paper done where people use machine learning, but data set is very small. That should ring a bell that this is not actually good. But then the question is, what does it mean small? Nobody knows exactly. Um, because there is no ex very precise rule of thumb or algorithm calculating these sample sizes for machine learning algorithms. And then another problem is selection bias, okay? So if my data set is already biased in terms of over-representing or under-representing certain types, certain populations of patients or certain types of patients, then my data are biased and my results can be biased too. Then I try to create some comparison table between these two algorithms. The main thing really is that machine learning is something that fully automates because we don't provide any knowledge to this algorithm. The algorithm just fully automates the decision process. Statistics, we need to provide some extra knowledge in order to create these, uh, these decision rules. Um, I also included slides on so-called creation of these credible intervals. So that's a work that I did on uh, actually epilepsy. We wanted to know how to monitor patients on epilepsy and instead of just calculating probability of this epileptic patient being resistant in addition to calculating this probability and as you see this probability as indicated by these crosses this probability is going up now a little bit down and again up stays the same and then up 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 what we also added are these credible intervals so this is how it works so now you see how these credible intervals are working and here they are even thinner because we are now very, very sure that the person is actually resistant to the epilepsy treatment. So this is my last slide. Um, so we showed that the classical statistical modeling approach can be actually very useful because it can help us to understand the associations or possible clinical, possible pathways, how disease develops and how it may re it relates to what we see on the image. It provides better utilization of data when some data is missing, like when those missing parts of the profiles can be very effective on smaller data sets like we showed, 50 times less smaller data set we used. We can incorporate prior knowledge and uh, in some clinical scenarios like in glaucoma can actually provide faster and more accurate solution than machine learning algorithms, but this is just a very unique case. and. This is my last slide. Um, I would like to very much also thank to all the scientists involved from University of Liverpool, to Colin, and also for Liverpool John Muir University. Thank you very much. <laughs>